Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like people are still coming in, uh, but I've got my co-host, Tiana, helping me with um, the waiting room. Uh, but let's go ahead. It is 12.01, so we'll get this get this party started. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the lunchtime, excuse me, lunchtime lecture series from the Fort Worth Botanic Garden and the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. I'm Dr. Brooke Best, Director of Research Programs, and I and my research colleagues host this lecture series, which takes place the first Tuesday of each month. Our next talk, if you can see that, um, will be Tuesday, March 1st, when Dr. Sula Vanderplank will present Adventures in Baja California Botany. And then you can see all this screen. This screen. We've also got our April 5th talk uh, scheduled, and that will be a reschedule from one that was going to take place late last year from um, some scientists at uh, NEON uh, talking about NEON projects. Okay, um, viewers today will remain muted throughout the lecture, but you can type your questions in the chat anytime and we'll go over them at the end during the Q&A session. Um, you can, of course, test the chat out now if you'd like, uh, telling us where you're watching from today. We will be recording this lecture for our archives um, and the speaker has allowed us to make the recording available on our YouTube channel. So that'll be up on the YouTube channel in a few weeks. We'll also put a link to that on the original Brit event page, a uh, web page for this, for this talk. Uh, you know the drill. If something happens, if you get cut off, you can just exit uh, and, and use the same link to come back in. If something gets choppy for you, I would uh, uh, advise you to close down other applications and to turn off your video if you have that on. Um, all right, well, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Nathan Taylor. Nathan's a PhD student in the Department of Plant Biology, Ecology, and Evolution at Oklahoma State University, where he works with Dr. Mark Fishbein. Nathan got his master's degree from Sul Ross State University out in Alpine uh, and worked at the herbarium there with the curator, Dr. A. Michael Powell. Uh, he's also worked as the land manager at I-20 Wildlife Preserve in Midland, Texas. Uh, Nathan is interested in most plants, he says, uh, and enjoys the challenges of identification, but his primary interest, I do believe, is in uh, euphorbia, specifically the section, is it anisophyllum or anisophyllum? Anisophyllum. Yep. Yeah, uh, formerly known as camasyce, which we all love, um, which is one of the topics, of course, he'll be discussing today. So, Nathan, I will hand it over to you now, and welcome. Let's see, I'll stop sharing. All right. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you, Brooke, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Euphorbia section in this film, of course, um, but today I'm gonna be focusing primarily on identification, um, particularly connecting tax, uh, sort of traditional taxonomic methods with iNaturalists. So, in order to do that, I'm going to um, give you a brief introduction to the section, tell you what it is, then I'm going to talk about the herbarium and field studies, um, mostly that I went through during my master's. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about uh, connecting that research to iNaturalists, and then I'll conclude. All right, so first off, what is euphorbia? So euphorbia is a worldwide genus um, of about 2,000 species. It is a giant genus. Uh, it's one of the, one of the largest um, in the world. It takes on a lot of different forms, including herbs, succulents, shrubs, trees. Um, and with that, we also have a lot of photosynthetic systems. So the succulents, um, of course, have CAM. The most herbaceous plants have C3 photosynthesis, but in the section that I'm studying, which we'll get to, in, uh, get to in a bit, they have C4 primarily, but also have uh, a handful of species that have either C3 or C2 photosynthesis. All right, so what unites euphorbia into this huge diverse genus? Well, that would be the Cyathium. And if you look at these little arrows on the lower right-hand photo, those little things are the Cyathea. So what is a Cyathium? So a Cyathium is an inflorescence. And on the outside, 
you have this involucre. So you have five fused bracts. And in between, you have uh, glands. Now, depending on what group you're studying, you may have five or four or even three or one. In section denisophone, they have typically have four. Um, and then they have this little tiny appendage that uh, is considered a rudimentary uh, fifth gland in quotation marks. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the involucre. On the inside, you have salmonate flowers, each consisting of a single salmon, and each sits upon a pedestal, um, also commonly known as the androphore or androped. Um, and then you have a central pistillate flower, which sits upon a pedestal again, commonly known as the gynophore or gynoped. Now there's a lot of diversity in cyathium structure. These are all from section anisophyllum. And what you'll notice that I didn't show in the previous slide is some species have these large showy appendages on the glands, um, but some of them don't. These are commonly called either glandular appendages or petaloid appendages. Okay, so that's the cyathium, that's euphorbia. Now let's get into the characteristics of the section. Now there are a lot of, a lot of characteristics that set this apart from the rest of the genus. The first one is sympodial br branching. And that is where you have a stem that terminates in a structure or lack of a structure. And then it branches out from side branches. Uh, it, br it branches out from the axillary branches. Um, now in section anisophyllum, it's pretty interesting because it actually has sympodial growth all the way down to the second, uh, second node. So basically all of the above ground growth of section anisophyllum comes from the cotyledonary nodes. So basically all the above ground growth comes from the, um, the buds of the seed leaves, which is pretty cool. But that also means that it has dorsoventral stems. So the stems have a clear upper side and clear lower side. And with that comes another thing that's interesting. It has asymmetric leaves. Now, this can, can easily be identified often by this uh, little lobe at the base. Typically it has a longer side and a shorter side with the longer side being on the upper side of the stem and the shorter side being on the lower side of the stem which makes sense if you're uh, trying to optimize the amount of sun sunlight you're capturing in a prostrate species. Now, these leaves are opposite. And in between each pair of opposite leaves, you have non-glandular stipules, um, typically a pair of them. Sometimes they can be fused, sometimes they're separate. Now, also with the leaves, you get this nice mosaic pattern called Kron's anatomy. And typically you, you, typically you see this in etiolated plants. It's not easy to see it in uh, plants that are growing under normal conditions. But Kron's anatomy is an indicator of C4 photosynthesis. Basically, uh, most of the chlorophyll is aggregated around the leaf veins. All right, so those are the leaves and stem vegetative characteristics. Um, now let's move on to the seeds. So the seeds are typically quadrangular and they lack caruncle. Now, just to show you what a caruncle is, I've included a picture of a member of the section poinsettia, and that little white arrow indicates a caruncle. And typically the seeds are mucilaginous when, when, when wet. Now the seed characteristics are not quite as universal as the, uh, as the vegetative characteristics. And there are exceptions to every single one of these characteristics, some of them more rare than others, but these, this generally gives you an idea of what to look for. And if you find a plant with three or more of these characteristics, you're probably safe in assuming it's, it's section and it's a film. All right, so now that you kind of got an idea of what section in this film is, let's go ahead and move on to um, my research. So first we'll cover, um, a lot of the stuff I did during my master's degree, a big focus was in herbarium and field studies. And, and during my master's, I focused on the Transpecus region of Texas. 
Now, what is the transpecus? Well, the transpecus is the area between the Pecos River, the starting and end point is indicated by the arrows, and the Rio Grande, starting and end point for this region indicated by the arrows. Now, part of the region that's outside, but typically included, uh, are the sand counties. And that's just because, floristically, they're fairly similar to the Transpecos. And this is Loving, uh, Wing, Ward, and Crane, Crane counties. Now, the reason this place is so interesting is because it has 39 species of section misophyllum and three varieties. Now, it's, uh, that, so that's 42 taxa to study um, in this one region alone. That's more than any other state in the U.S. Um, and nine of those species are endemic to the region uh, within the U.S. So pretty good, pretty good place to, to study, to study the, the group. And let's move on to the methods. So how do you sort of identify a plant? Um, that's really been a major focus of mine, and this is sort of the theme of this talk, is how do you identify these plants? Well, under most circumstances, uh, let's say that the traditional methods, um, you learn the morphological concept of the species by comparing um, across many different herbarium specimens, um, you do a review of the taxonomic lit literature, and you, you link those specimens and the concepts of those specimens back to the specimens cited in the literature and the type specimens. Now for right field identification, you typically just find a plant, make a specimen, key it out using the taxonomic literature, and then compare, uh, compare those with the, the herbarium specimens. Pretty straightforward. So a lot of my work um, took place at these various uh, herbaria. Um, I visited a lot of a lot of herbaria during during my master's degree, but in particular, I focused on Soros State University because that's where I was based at the time. And it just so happens that ha that that has a lot of specimens from the Transpecus. Go figure. Um, there are about eight that. When I tallied these numbers during my master's, there were about 1,800 specimens of section anisophyllum at that herbarium, and at least 1,700 of those were from the Transpecus. Um, and this map to the right shows about the, 20, or the 200 georeferenced um, specimens from that herbarium. All right, so I also looked at a lot of online herbaria and have seen many more since. Um, but that gave me access to many of the type specimens for, for this work. All right, so let's move on to field work. So during my, during my field work, I was able to observe all of the taxa in the Transpecus, um, which was really nice. But I think even more important, 13 of those species occurred on Solros campus alone. So I was able to basically live with those species for the four years while I was doing my bachelor's and master's. Um, that gave, got me very acquainted with the, the morphology of the plants. All right. So I went to a lot of different locations, as you saw from the, from the, uh, from the map here. But some of the more noteworthy locations, um, these, these sand dunes in Crane County, uh, Utah was a very important place for one aspect of my work. Um, but you'll notice that some of these are really scenic. Some of these are much less so. So the place in Tucson, Arizona, um, this was literally a hotel parking lot and there were like five species growing there. And, uh, you know, these, these plants will, a lot of these plant species will grow anywhere, um, which is really nice for me because I can just, you know, go to a parking lot and there you are. Um, but yeah, so I, I visited, visited these lo locations to get some sense of uh, what the plants looked like in the field. All right. So here are some of the key findings. Um, I want to go over this uh, briefly. I could go into it a lot in a lot more detail, but I uh, want to save plenty of room for iNaturalist. Um, so just briefly, 
uh, three new species to Texas, Euphorbia ophthalmica, a weedy species. Um, that's primarily in the eastern half of Texas, but there are some waifs to, to West Texas. Uh, Euphorbia vermiculata, previously only known from um, New Mexico and Arizona in the southwestern United States. Euphorbia abram, and Euphorbia abram siena, which has actually been collected in the region since the 1900s um, by Mary Sophie Young, but uh, hasn't been recognized until recently because Johnston considered it a, uh, a rare aber aberrant form of Euphorbia glyptosperma. So that was a fun, fun little project. Um, the other thing that I did is I was able to get some better elaboration on the Euphorbia fendleri um, complex species complex. It's a very diverse group that um, ranges throughout the western half of the United States. And in particular, um, I found that the Great Plains plants, which most of Texas consists of the Great Plains plants, um, is distinct from uh, the sort of western concept of Euphorbia fendleri. Like if you if you look at the plants of Euphorbia fendleri from Texas and the ones from Utah, they're very different different species. However, the plants from Utah, um, even though they look somewhat more similar to the Texas uh, the Texas Euphorbia fendleri, they actually intergrade with Euphorbia ketocalyx, which is this narrow leaf species on the on the left here, and so you have sort of these two different two different species, uh, one of them forming a very complicated species complex, and I'm still working on writing that that up. Um, and then finally, this is the probably the most fun fun part: um, three new species, um, all previously referred to as Euphorbia bellandrina. So that's this species on the right here, which is rare and restricted to Bokeas Canyon, primarily. Um, Euphorbia cryptorubra, that was published in 2016. Um, that one is, that one's represented by the blue dots on the map. Um, the Euphorbia species Nova 1, um, that occurs only in Big Bend National Park. That's the red dots here. Oh, if my cursor will come up. So that's the red dots. And then the Euphorbia species Nova 2 um, is the yellow dots here, but it ranges all the way into New Mexico and Arizona. So that one's a that one's a pretty cool, cool species. Note that the characteristics, um, there are differences in characteristics of the seeds um, and some cyathial characteristics that are that are different. All right. So the ne next thing I want to talk about is sort of the key characteristics that um, I found needed greater elaboration or were useful. In particular, leaf maculations, they're underutilized as a taxonomic characteristic. And even though they're not consistent, their presence isn't consistent, their shape is often consistent. So like here, the sort of splotchy pattern only er, primarily occurs in Euphorbia abramsiana. Whereas in other species, you may have this more linear, um, linear shape. Also, the species that produce maculations can either produce them or not, but there are some species that never, uh, never produce them, which means that you can sort of exclude that species, those species if you have a maculation present. You also have variations in sort of vein ornamentation. In Euphorbia abram siena, it's kind of hard to tell but you have sort of these pale lines in the positions of pinnate venation. And on Euphorbia hisopifolia here, you have sort of this pale line over the mid vein. All right, so the next characteristic I wanna talk about is habit. And this is used as a key characteristic, but there are some difficulties that aren't oft often elaborated on. So first of all, um, Erect plants can grow as a consequence of uh, etiolation or of drought. Um, either process can make those plants grow straight upright and you'll key it to the wrong spot if you have that characteristic in your key. Also, fungal rust can make the, make the plants grow upright. 
Now, there are a couple species that will grow prostrate regardless of whether they're experiencing etiolation or drought, but they will grow upright when experiencing the rust. Um, and that's Euphorbia, uh, Euphorbia serpens and Euphorbia albomarginata. All right, so that's sort of a review of my master's work. Um, and now I want to get on to the, what I consider the fun part, which is the iNaturalist um, stuff. So in, I think it was 2016, uh, I just got out of my master's degree and I moved to, back to uh, the High Plains of Texas. And uh, I found myself um, pretty far away from any local herbaria. And uh, so I, I stumbled on iNaturalist and that sort of, in some ways, um, filled that hole in my, uh, uh, in my heart for, uh, identification. So, <laughs> um, it, it, fill, it, it, it scratched that itch, so to speak. Um, so let's go over a, a, an introduction of what it is. So first of all, how does it work? Really simple. Someone takes a photo of an organism, uploads the photo and the metadata, and creates an observation. That's a unique occurrence. Um, and then members of the community come on and identify those observations. So what is iNaturalist? It's kind of kind of hard to hard to say, but in general, it's a sort of a social networking site for for naturalists. Um, think of it as Facebook, where instead of posting a posting a photo and you end up in a political uh, screaming match, you uh, end up in a identification screaming match, um, or more likely a friendly discussion on uh, on the identification. Um, and then secondarily, it serves as a way of collecting data and uh, storing data, although that's less a focus of iNaturalist and more a focus of GBIF, the sort of storing data part. Now, what's the opportunity that uh, iNaturalist presents? Well, there's a lot of data. Over 89 million observations, over 2 million people who have observed those observations, over 200,000 people identifying those observations, and over 340,000 species represented by those observations. Now, I hope the numbers speak for themselves in saying that that's a lot of data that we, we can hopefully utilize. So let's sort of look at the, the, the benefits and the challenges as it concerns identification. So first, there's a huge sample size. That's a major benefit. Um, and it's worldwide sampling, fresh material, it's really quick and easy to provide an, provide an identification. Now here are the challenges. The huge sample of size is a benefit and a challenge. <laughs> um, but also the identifications are often wrong um, because it is citizen scientists after all who are contributing the observation and there are varying levels of expertise that comes along with that. Um, there's also over-representation of common species and uh, urban areas. Um, but I think the most important point for this conversation is that the identification methods are actually fairly different for this than they are for um, the field and herbarium uh, studies that I mentioned above. So this pre presents a unique opportunity for sort of investigating how to identify based on photos and connect that back to, um, to the taxonomic literature. So let's look at uh, my study system. Um, oh, yeah, before I do that, uh, why, why should we attempt to, to, to do photo identification in the first place? Well, there are, I, I looked it up and on GBIF, it says there are fifth, about around 1,500 uh, or, uh, scientific articles that have utilized iNaturalist data. Um, and that's, that's a lot of studies. And more importantly, good data relies on good identifications. Those identifications, good identifications, rely on good resources. But most of those identifications that we use um, rely on resources based on specimens which means that the taxonomic keys don't work for 
photo identification. And that's kind of a problem. So let's go to um, the sort of different types of identification sources. So there are field guides. Um, and if you're lucky, those field guides will cite the floras. If you're lucky, those floras will cite the taxonomic treatments. And if you're lucky, those taxonomic treatments, well, essentially all taxonomic treatments will cite the specimens. So you're working at two different levels here. For traditional methods, you're operating at this sort of systematic treatment and uh, original specimen le level, whereas typically the resources for photo identification are all the way up here in, in field guides. So there's a lot of opportunity for disconnect between these treatments, you know, as you as you navigate higher through the literature. Um, so let's sort of keep that in mind and trans and sort of give give an idea of what uh, photo identification is. So I consider it sort of a, a hybrid form of ID identification where it incorporates the limitations of field identification and herbarium identification all at once. And that's what makes things really tricky um, because you have the limited sampling uh, problem of herbarium identification tied with the limited availability to study characters of the field identification problem. Um, Additionally, it's fresh material, and if all the resources are based on herbarium specimens, that contrib contributes to the, the, the difficulty. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, if you look at these photos, you've got the specimen, um, you've got limited number of species on this, uh, in this canyon. You can look at uh, as many individuals as you want but you may have limited ability to study those characteristics. But from identifying or trying to identify this photo, this is basically what you've got. You can't really get, you can't always get more information than what's provided here. Okay, now let's try and look at this problem in the context of section anisophilum. Um, so first off, we have the problem of seeds. The vast majority of taxonomic resources um, require seeds for identification. So if you try to key out those, those plants, it's just not going to work. It, it just simply will not work. Um, you might be able to get through a couple couplets, but eventually you're going to ru run into a, uh, a seed uh, couplet and you're going to get stuck. Um, also, you can't use measurements on photos unless someone provided the measurements, which is pretty rare. Um, and you also need that for, for identification to work through those keys. Now, the descriptions can be helpful, but they're pretty limited. And in particular, the terminology used is often fairly unspecific, especially regarding the leaves. Um, there are a lot of really old resources I've looked at where um, the, the writer didn't even sort of indicate that the leaves were opposite. And you, from that, you can't even tell what section it's in. Um, so there, there are some limitations there. And compounding on that, you have variable life stages and growth conditions. So I've told you a lot about the problems, but here's the thing. Identification is still possible. And I've added a lot of identifications, and I think I've been done pretty well at, at doing that. Um, so what do we need in order to do that? Well, we need a method. So this is sort of my method. I don't know if it's the best method or if it's, if you know there's a better way to do it, but um, this method links it back to the herbarium specimens and ultimately to type specimens. Um, and what I first do is learn the, learn the species based on the herbarium specimens. That's a pretty important step because you've got to connect it to the, the sort of taxonomic tradition. Um, 
then you've got to you've got to find the characteristics in the herbarium specimens that is most likely to be helpful in photos. Once you've done that, you can use those characteristics to identify the species to photo, uh, identify the species from the photos. Um, and then you can use all of those new characteristics to identify sort of photos on mass, however you decide to, to decide to do it based on those characteristics that you found. Now, you can take that a step further and if you're finding new characteristics, you can start to apply those to other, uh, to see if you can apply those to other populations and other species um, to help you understand those uh, plants better, regardless of whether you're talking about um, field plants, herbarium plants, or photos of plants. Now, here's the, the last, number six is both the most challenging but the most fun part of the process for me. And that's figuring out how to articulate the characteristics in a consistent way. And iNaturalist actually form, uh, provides a really good form for figuring out how to articulate those characteristics. And then the last part is, you know, pretty straightforward writing it down because if you don't write it down, you'll inevitably forget. <laughs> so I wanna briefly walk you through an example of where I sort of applied these methods. Um, and basically, this is a, a new species from the uh, Baja California Peninsula that uh, I found on iNaturalist and um, in collaboration with John Redman, uh, we're, we're planning to describe. Um, so uh, several, a uh, few years ago, I stumbled across this on, on iNaturalist and when I saw it, I knew it looked different. It looked distinct. Um, however, I didn't quite know why it looked distinct, but I did, uh, I had started studying the, um, the Baja California Peninsula species and knew that it didn't look like any of those. So I immediately contacted John Rubman because I knew he was the expert in the Baja California Peninsula and he thought it was new. Uh, and I co contacted um, Victor Simon because I know he's done a lot of work in the region. He thought it might be Euphorbia serpillifolia, but he was sort of unsure. And he said that if I thought it was new, then, you know, I should go ahead and start, or I should, I should work on describing it. Well, since I knew serpillifolia from my work in the U.S., I knew that it was fairly distinct from that. So because I knew all of the species, all the different al alternative species, I was able to, to say that this is something new. Now, what are the unique characteristics of this species? So if you'll notice in, in this photo, these proximal leaves look quite a bit different than these distal leaves. Basically, it's got heteroblasty going on here which is a, a fancy word for saying that the leaves look different um, and they look different ontologically. So the proximal leaves are asymmetric, but the distal leaves are nearly, uh, nearly symmetrical, which is really weird for the section. But it's got another thing going on, which is really strange as well. So you might think that this leaf and this leaf come off the same node, but if you flip the specimen over, You'll notice that they actually come off at different nodes, which is really strange. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the pair on this end is much, much smaller, or the, the leaf on this side is much, much smaller than the leaf on this side. So I found, figured out the term for it, uh, the, the term for it is actually anisophily. Uh, which um, is interesting because the section name is anisophilum. Uh, you would have thought I would have made that connection sooner, but uh, it took, took looking at this, this uh, species to make that connection. But, um, but yeah, so it's got, it's got heteroblasty and anisophily going on and very extreme versions of those, those two characteristics. But the thing is, come to find out, this is not exactly it's not quite as unique a characteristic as I thought. It turns out that a lot of species 
um, within the section exhibit both heteroblasty and anisophily, just much subtler forms of it. So let's look at an example of how you can sort of apply this. Um, so Euphorbia ophthalmica is a species complex in, uh, in Mexico that ranges all the way north to the US and it's sort of spread almost worldwide um, now. But note that the, the glomerules have these sort of alternate leaves or seemingly alternate leaves. Um, I've sort of started calling them pseudo alternate leaves because it's actually an extreme, another extreme form of anisophily where the other uh, pair has been reduced or the other leaf in, in the pair has been reduced to basically a little scale um, about the size of the stipules. So some, pop, some populations of Euphorbia ophthalmica produce these pseudo alternate leaves and some of them don't. So by sort of understanding that these leaves are anisophilus, we can sort of figure out, okay, how are these different populations evolving? Now, again, this is fairly preliminary, but uh, it's, it's something that I'm, I've been looking into. So um, you also have the potential applications to, to other species complex, including Euphorbia dioica, which is a real nightmare of a species complex. Um, and can even use that to help distinguish like uh, Euphorbia maculata and Euphorbia humifusa. I've been using some of this to, to help me distinguish those two species, which are really tricky. Um, and then also the Euphorbia fimbleri complex, which uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk. So let's just walk through how this method applies to this research. So first I suspected it was new, <clears throat> not really a part of the process, but an important one in this. Um, I looked at specimens of all the described species from the re re region. I expanded my expertise that falls under one and two. Um, I examined the iNaturalist photos of all the different species um, and those contributed by uh, Dr. Redman. And, you know, that's, that's number three. That's figuring out uh, what the, the photos look like, the, the form looks like from the photos. And then I kind of skipped a step and uh, went directly to comparing the, um, the known species to the, the, what I thought was the new species. And then I again took a step back and actually examined the, uh, the specimen of the new species directly. So I went, I sort of went from the beginning of the process to the end of the process back to the beginning. But at the end, we land on six, which is finding and utilizing those new, new characteristics um, for uh, studying the Euphorbia ophthalmica pro, uh, complex. So it's not a linear process. That's basically all I'm saying here is that a lot of elements are, limit, are linear. And especially when you're talking about in learning individual species that are known, it's a fairly linear process, but it, uh, you can sort of mix and, mix and match this process um, as time goes on. But these are sort of the key, key factors that need to be, um, need to be considered when uh, trying to you know, identify things from photos. And I think I'm going to skip that part in the interest of time and skip straight to the, the key results and the resources. Um, so first of all, we have a new species, um, which I presented today, a couple state records, um, which I would get into, but uh, I don't want to go too long, um, and three iNaturalist uh, projects. And these have really been sort of my sounding board for, for learning this method. Um, and during, during this process, I've created about 34 Euphorbia identification resources um, across these various projects, mostly in the Euphorbia Species of the United States project. Um, and along with that, I 
identified about, or I added identifications to about 50,000 uh, section nine, section in this film observations for, for reference for, for future um, people wanting to identify um, these, the species from photos. Um, but really that process of creating these field guides while identifying the, the species and commun communicating with the, the iNaturalist community has really made the identification resources uh, quite a bit better. Um, so those are really the two things I'm, I'm most proud of uh, in all this. The, the new species and the state records are in some ways almost secondary to the finding these new characteristics and sort of figuring out the method of identification. All right, so to conclude, um, the importance and feasibility of identification. So iNaturalist data is used in research. Um, there are very few sources that rely on, or very few uh, resources that rely on primary, um, primary sources for identification from photos. Um, but high quality identifications from photographs are possible. Um, and there need to be more resources sort of aimed at, um, high, the, the sort of qual high quality identification from photo photographs, um, based on observations or based on, uh, based on photo the photographs themselves instead of specimens. If we want a, a, a very high level uh, or high quality identification um, for, for the data that's being produced by iNaturalist. So the, on the flip side, looking at the utility of iNaturalist for taxonomists, it facilitates taxonomic refinement. It may lead to new learning, new characteristics, and it's just an additional source of occurrence data, which we can utilize. And finally, um, integration of identification based on specimens and based on photos, it provides a lot of challenges, but it's a, it's a worthwhile process because um, it leads to a more complete view of the organism you're studying. And it ultimately leads to better identification tools that you can, you can use um, moving forward. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people, um, <laughs> Oklahoma State University, Solaros State University, um, the many herbaria that I visited uh, without the, uh, without whose war, uh, without whose uh, time would this uh, research wouldn't be possible. I naturalist, the many, many observers who have posted um, observations, the, the many people who've curated and identified um, euphorbia have helped me in that process. Um, the different data, data repositories, and I'd like to offer specific thanks to uh, A. Michael Powell, Victor Steinman, and Job, John Redman for helpful comments. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for, for listening.